Dr. Arnold is happy to answer all of the questions that you may have, so you can use the chat or you can choose to unmute and answer the question. She does not mind the interruption. There will be also time for question and answers at the end of the session. So a little bit about Dr. Arnold. Amy Arnold is an associate professor in the Department of Neural and Behavioral Sciences at the Penn State College of Medicine. She received a PhD in physiology and pharmacology in 2009, a master's of science in clinical investigation in 2014, and postdoctoral fellowship training at the Vanderbilt Autonomic Dysfunction Center. Her primary NIH-funded area of research examines the neural and hormonal mechanisms regulating blood pressure in cardiovascular-related diseases, including hypertension and obesity. In addition, she is regarded as an international expert in cardiovascular autonomic disorders, including postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, which is the focus of our talk today. She has over 85 publications and has received continuous research funding for over 10 years in these areas of research. So I'll turn it over now to our expert, Dr. Amy Arnold. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I assume you're there, <laughs> the void. Um, as, as Jess mentioned, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. Um, I will share my screen. Jess, can you see it? Okay. Um, so it today, great. today I'm going to be talking about a project called Neural Correlates of Cognitive Dysfunction and Postural Tachycardia Syndrome, or POTS. Um, I know we usually end this way, but I wanted to actually start with my acknowledgments. Um, so first, I'd like to acknowledge um, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Dr. Amanda Miller, who really helped me to conceive and execute these studies, uh, the Penn State Heart and Vascular Institute, including Amy Kaufman and Cheryl Blaha, research nurses involved in this study, Dr. Urs Leuenberger, a cardiologist that kind of oversaw these studies, Mick Herr, a clinical engineer, and Paul Dal Dalton, a research technologist. In addition, uh, Dr. Soraya Samai and Barb Bentz, who were critical to helping us recruit uh, POTS patients for this study and helping to manage medications and other issues, um, as well as the Center for NMR Research, where we conducted the studies, including Dr. Jean Lee Wong, who is a faculty member in the Department of Radiology, and Jeff Vasek. Uh, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge the funding for this project, which came from the CTSI Bridges to Translation 5 mechanism. Uh, it was awarded in 2019, but as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic quickly hit right after it was awarded. So um, we were grateful to receive a few no-cost extensions and wrapped up uh, this pilot study in early 2023. Um, so I wanted to start with this team because uh, while I'm an expert in POTS, I'm not necessarily an expert in some of the imaging methods we use today. Um, and it really took a village to be able to get this, this study kind of completed. Uh, so first, I'd like to give you a brief reminder uh, that we, our bodies need a little bit of help when we stand up. Uh, so when we go from a lying down to a standing position, there is a shift in our blood volume where the blood goes kind of from our thorax region down into our lower extremities. Uh, this results in a gravitational venous pooling of about 500 to 1,000 milliliters in our lower extremities, uh, resulting in a reduced return of blood to the heart, as well as a reduced cardiac output. Um, and our body has complex cardiovascular reflex mechanisms in place to compensate for this blood pooling. So there's an increase in sympathetic nervous system tone that helps to constrict our blood vessels and allow the blood to return back to our heart so that it can pump out to the rest of the body that helps us to recover our cardiac output and to restore our blood volume. So most of us, when we stand up, we experience little to no change in our blood pressure because of these reflex mechanisms. However, there are individuals that have issues with some of these mechanisms where they cannot increase their sympathetic tone appropriately, and that can result in disorders of orthostatic intolerance, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, so the disorder I'll talk about today is called postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS. And this is a, a heterogeneous clinical syndrome in which patients are okay lying down. They have a normal heart rate, a normal sinus rhythm. Um, but when they stand up, there's blood pooling in their lower extremities. And there's um, some kind of impairment in those reflex mechanisms that does not allow the blood to return to their heart. And as a result, they have a compensatory 
uh, exaggerated tachycardia or an increase in heart rate to try to maintain their blood pressure. And in these patients, that increase in heart rate uh, is greater than 30 beats per minute in adults or 40 beats per minute in adolescents. So it's a sinus tachycardia. Uh, this tachycardia is maintained the entire time that they're standing. Um, so we typically diagnose POTS. These are the consensus diagnostic criteria for POTS. So it's a heart rate increase greater or equal to 30 beats per minute within 10 minutes of upright posture in adults and an increase of greater than 40 beats per minute in adolescents age 12 to 19 years of age. This is because adolescents have some orthostatic tachycardia already just due to physiological mechanisms. Um, and there are no guidelines under 12 years of age. With this increase in heart rate, there has to be an absence of orthostatic hypotension, which is a sustained drop in blood pressure greater than 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury. They have to have symptoms of orthostatic intolerance for at least six months. So this is a chronic disorder and they have to have absence of overt causes for the sinus tachycardia, um, such as acute phys physiological stimuli like caffeine, um, dietary influences, other medical conditions or medications that may cause that tachycardia. So just as, a, as an example of what this might look like, this is a response to a head up tilt table testing in a healthy subject. So in the bottom, you can see when the line is flat down here. Can you see my cursor? Sorry. Okay. This is when the patient is lying down and then the table is tilted head up to an angle of 70 degrees. So when the line elevates, that's when they're tilted and then they go back down to supine. So when a healthy person is tilted up, you can see that their blood pressure remains fairly stable and their heart rate is fairly stable as well. When a patient with POTS is tilted, their blood pressure is able to be maintained, but that's accompanied by this sustained increase in heart rate that you can see up here. And as soon as the patient is returned to a supine position, the heart rate starts to drop again. Um, so that's kind of what a patient with POTS would look like on a diagnostic test. Uh, so POTS has become the most common chronic autonomic nervous system disorder worldwide. Uh, these are kind of older estimates, but it's estimated to affect about 0.2 to 1% of the population in developed countries, uh, which would re relate to about half a million to 3 million individuals in the United States. Um, I will add that since the COVID-19 pandemic has occurred, there's been an increase in patients presenting with POTS-like symptoms or diagnosed with POTS as a result of long COVID. So this number is only increasing, I would say. Um, and just for your knowledge, uh, this disease has actually been referred to several names in the literature over the past several decades. So I refer to it as postural tachycardia syndrome. Some people say postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, soldier's heart, DaCosta syndrome. So you'll see several names in the literature for this disorder. Uh, this disease has a very strong female predominance. So about 80 to 90% of the patients presenting with this disease appear to be female. Uh, the age of onset is typically between 13 to 50 years of age. So this is a, often a premenopausal disorder. And about half of these patients develop symptoms by adolescence. Over 90% of patients um, appear to be Caucasian race and non-Hispanic ethnicity. Uh, the reason for this is not clear. It's unclear if this is a disease of European ancestry, for example, or if um, this really reflects kind of barriers to healthcare or access to care. Um, but if you look in the literature in clinical trials, almost all of the patients enrolled are, are Caucasian and non-Hispanic. And there's a family history of tachycardia or orthostatic intolerance reported in about 13% of patients. Uh, so this is just one example of these demographics that I pulled from the literature. This is a survey-based community study that was published in 2009 by Shaw and colleagues. Um, so they surveyed almost 5,000 POTS patients. And of these 5,000, 94% were female, 93% were white, and 92% were non-Hispanic. Uh, when they looked at the age of onset, uh, you can see this is the distribution of age of onset and as you'll notice, there's very few patients kind of in this early childhood age, as well as few patients kind of post peri postmenopausal. And the majority of patients are kind of in this uh, late adolescent, early adult range. Uh, what causes POTS? The exact precipitating factor is unknown, 
In 60% of patients, uh, they report that the symptoms develop gradually over time without an identifiable precipitating factor. But in about 40% of patients, they report a subacute onset within three months following a specific event. Uh, so this is, again, data from that Shaw paper that I just showed you. And about 41% of that subset of patients reported POTS onset following a viral or bacterial infection, 12% following a surgical procedure, 9% following pregnancy, 6% uh, following vaccination, typically HPV vaccination, 5% following puberty, and 4% from concussion. Uh, these are anecdotal patient self-reported uh, triggers. There are many proposed underlying pathophysiological mechanisms uh, for POTS. None have been confirmed as absolute. Um, clinicians have tend to group these into what we call subtypes. Um, the one thing I'll note about these subtypes is that they often overlap. So a patient can have more than one of these subtypes. Um, and there's really not standard definitions for them, but I'll just kind of give you a brief overview of what people think could underlie POTS. Um, first, there's uh, neuropathic POTS in which there's a peripheral adrenergic denervation that prevents their, their leg muscles from constricting and returning uh, blood to the heart. There is a hyperadrenergic subset in which there's excessive sympathetic discharge, and these patients typically have very high plasma norepinephrine levels upon standing. A hypovolemic subtype in which there's low blood volume, and there's a compensatory tachycardia to account for that low blood volume. This has been associated with a dysregulation of the renin and angiotensin system. Uh, there's emerging evidence suggesting there could be an autoimmune subtype in which these patients have autoantibodies to various receptors involved in the autonomic nervous system control. Uh, there's a handful of patients that have mast cell activation in which they experience episodic flushing with the tachycardia that's due to uh, an increase in urine methylhistamines. And a very small proportion of patients have been found to have a genetic cause in which there is a single point mutation in uh, causing loss of function in the norepinephrine transporter. So these are all of the proposed subtypes. Again, patients can have more than one of these subtypes and there's no single identifiable cause. Uh, in terms of symptoms, there are some classical uh, orthostatic symptoms that typically accompany POTS. Uh, the top one is lightheadedness. So 99% of patients will experience lightheadedness when they stand up. 97% uh, experience tachycardia that they can actually feel. So kind of, you know, palpitations. Um, these patients typically don't faint. They don't have overt syncope but many of them have pre-syncopal episodes in which they feel like they're gonna faint. Uh, a lot of patients can experience headaches, uh, difficulty concentrating, nausea, shortness of breath, uh, muscle pain, and abdominal pain. And then about half of patients with POTS can experience this uh, dependent acrocyanosis. So I don't know if it's easy to see, but um, as I mentioned, there's blood pooling in the lower extremities. And so some patients will actually experience a color change in their legs well, they'll develop this kind of deep uh, purplish blue coloring in the legs due to that blood pooling that can sometimes also be accompanied by some uh, swelling or edema in the lower extremities as well. So in addition to these orthostatic symptoms, uh, POTS patients can also have symptoms that are not related to standing or non-orthostatic symptoms. This can include things like gastrointestinal issues, uh, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, urinary issues, um, sweating issues, difficulty maintaining temperature, exercise intolerance, uh, hyperventilation. Uh, and the thing I want to touch upon today is kind of some of the neuropsychological and cognitive issues that these patients also experience. Um, so it's been reported in several studies that POTS patients have a reduced health-related quality of life um, due to the presence of chronic illness. Uh, this is actually pretty substantial as um, people have found that the reduced quality of life is similar to patients with heart failure or COPD. So it's, it's pretty severe. Um, some studies have looked at the prevalence of psychiatric disorders in this patient population and have found they have similar prevalence of general psychiatric disorders compared to the, the general population. But these patients are observed to have mild to moderate depression and anxiety symptoms. In terms of cognitive function, uh, cognitive dysfunction, or what we term brain fog, 
is an almost universal report in POTS patients. And uh, this can occur even while the patients are lying down or seated. So it's not necessarily related to the standing in these patients. Uh, in a survey-based study in 2013 by Ross and colleagues, 96% of patients reported having brain fog. And over 80% of those patients reported that this brain fog was to a level that interfered with their educational and work activities. And, and what the brain fog really is, is a constellation of symptoms that impairs their intellectual functioning to a level that can interfere with daily activities. Uh, so how do POTS patients describe this brain fog? Uh, so they often say things like they have issues, um, they have difficulty thinking, concentrating, or paying attention. They're forgetful, they have trouble remembering things. They have a cloudy, slow, or fuzzy feeling in their head. Their mind went blank, or they, they can't find the right words in a situation. Um, despite this high impact in most patients reporting this, the precise nature of this brain fog and the optimal therapeutic strategies are really poorly described. Um, so, you know, when we started these studies, we wanted to know what, what actually is this brain fog in POTS? What is the profile? So we started to look in the literature and we were actually quite shocked that at that time, probably five years ago, there were less than five studies in the entire literature looking at the brain fog in these patients. Uh, so a really poorly studied phenomenon, even today, I would say there's probably less than 15 studies even to date on this topic. Uh, so what we know so far is that uh, the cognitive dysfunction in POTS does appear to be associated with impaired measures of attention. Uh, this was an initial study on attention conducted in 2009 at Vanderbilt, and they gave the DSM-4 um, survey of inattention to normal healthy controls, POTS patients, patients with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and compared it to the background population. And what they found was that POTS patients had elevated measures of inattention compared to healthy controls, but that it was to a lesser degree than patients with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So kind of a, a moderate attention profile. Um, our lab then published a second study looking at the rough two and seven speed score of attention. And in this task, you'll see here, there's a series of numbers and the patients are asked to only select out the numbers seven and two and they're timed and how many numbers they can correctly select out is calculated into a T-score. And these dotted lines represent kind of the normal values within, within one standard deviation of a, a T-score of 50. And so hopefully you can see that the POTS patients on average had a lower T-score than the healthy controls. And about a third of the patients had a T-score less than 40, which would mean they had um, clinically significant impairment in this measure of attention. And then a third study looked at the identific identification task um, from Cog State, the Cog State computerized battery in healthy controls in the white bars and POTS patients in the black bars. And they looked while they were supine or following a 60 degree head up tilt. And what they found was that in the supine position, the POTS patients performed similar to the controls, but when the patients were tilted up, uh, they saw that the POTS patients performed worse on this task compared to controls, and there was a worsening of their performance compared to when they were supine. So again, suggesting these patients have uh, impaired measures of attention. We then looked at measures of executive function. Uh, so very simply, executive function is our ability to take in information, process it, and spit it back out. Uh, that is not very clinically <laughs> precise, but... Um, and so we did several tasks of executive function. The first one's called Trails B. Uh, in this task, you're presented a series of numbers and letters, as in this example, and you have to connect them in order from number to letter. So for example, 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D. And you're timed again on how quickly this can be accomplished. A T-score of 50 is the average. The dotted lines represent kind of a normal functioning. And again, POTS patients performed worse on this task compared to healthy controls, suggesting some impairment in executive function. And then we also did the Stroop test. Um, in the Stroop test, you're presented with a series of words, and those words can be in the same color as the word says, or they can be in different colors than the word said. So for example, this first one, it says the word blue, but it's actually in red ink. And the participant is asked to tell you not what the word says, but what color the ink is written in. 
um, and they're timed to see how, how well and quickly they can do this. And again, on this task of executive function, the POTS patients performed worse than the healthy controls. And again, if you look at these dotted lines, about a third of the patients performed at a level that we would say is clinically meaningful impairment. I'm suggesting there are problems with executive function. And then finally, a series of studies from Julian Stewart and colleagues at the New York College of Medicine have looked at um, measures of working memory in patients with POTS and comorbid chronic fatigue syndrome. These are adolescent POTS patients. And to do this, they used a test called the NBAC test um, in which you're asked to remember a series of numbers and subtract back. Um, this is usually under a kind of a mental stress where they're kind of yell not yelling at you, but telling you to do better. Um, and so what they saw was that um, these are the degrees of tilt. So zero is the patients are supine, and then they were gradually tilted upward to an angle of 75 degrees. So as the POTS patients were tilted upwards in black, they had less correct responses compared to healthy controls, more missed responses, and this got worse as the level of NBAC got harder. So suggesting there's some impairment in working memory in these patients as well. Um, so I, I've now shown you most of the studies um, characterizing cognitive dysfunction in POTS. It's not a lot, um, but there is evidence at least for some deficits in attention, executive function, and working memory in these patients. Um, I didn't show these data, but these um, deficits were actually selective. So we gave other measures of cognitive function, such as psychomotor speed and verbal fluency, and those were actually intact. So it wasn't a blanket impairment of cognitive function. It was selective to these domains. Um, we did observe cognitive dysfunction even in the supine or seated position when their heart rate and symptoms should be minimized. So there is some kind of underlying pathophysiological connection there. And you may have noticed this, um, while on average the POTS patients were lower, there was only about a third that were technically kind of below the, the dotted line, which were clinically meaningful impairment. But if you remember from the beginning, I told you almost all of them say they have problems with cognitive function. So there's a little bit of a mismatch between what patients report and what we can actually measure with these tests. And that could be for a variety of reasons, these tests may not be sensitive enough to pick up those deficits, or there could be a, a perception mismatch in which they feel well, don't feel well, but they're actually doing okay. Um, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, so what causes this cognitive dysfunction in POTS? Uh, we, we really don't know. Uh, this is data from a self-reported patient survey conducted by Ross and colleagues in 2013. And POTS patients reported what triggers their brain fog and what relieves it. Um, so the top triggers were fatigue, lack of sleep, dehydration, feeling faint, heat, aerobic exercise, walking, weather changes. Um, so these are just kind of self-reported things. Um, there's been a couple of studies in literature. Uh, one theory is that there could be altered brain norepinephrine pathways so changes in norepinephrine levels within the brain can disrupt cognitive function. Uh, this has not been proven. It's, it's a theory at this point. There was one study in 2015 uh, that showed abnormalities in brain structure and function in a small group of patients. Uh, so what they found was, <clears throat> excuse me, reduced gray matter volume in autonomic and emotional arousal brain regions and reduced white matter volume in primary somatosensory regions. And they hypothesize this could contribute to an increased vulnerability to autonomic and psychiatric symptoms. Dr. Arnold, we have a question in, for you in the chat yeah, from Kelsey please. stoltz -Fuss. And she wants to know, was your study population similar to the larger POTS population, majority white, non-Hispanic, female? Yeah. So <clears throat> I was at Vanderbilt for probably six years and worked in their autonomic dysfunction center, which is a national referral center for these patients and where that study was conducted. I don't think we studied one male patient the entire time I was there. And I think we had one African-American patient and one Hispanic patient. These are patients that send in their information to us. So we're not selecting them out. Um, so, so it does kind of reflect what I've seen. Again, I'm not sure if that reflects actual 
ancestry or genetic predispositions, or if, you know, there's barriers to a care, maybe, maybe certain populations can't apply to these tertiary care centers that are expensive and require travel. I don't know the answer to that, but yes, all of these studies are primarily Caucasian, non-Hispanic females. Pause for a second if there's any other questions right now. No? Okay. Um, so in terms of other causes of cognitive dysfunction, uh, there's been a handful of studies primarily by the same group, looking at cerebral blood flow in these patients. Um, most of these have used what's called a transcranial Doppler system, where they can put an ultrasound probe into a, a window into the brain that looks at the middle cerebral artery, and they can look at flow in just that one vessel. Um, and those studies have generally shown that there is reduced cerebral blood flow in POTS patients as they stand up, and that there may be a, a change in the neurovascular coupling in these patients in terms of cerebral blood flow. So that, that is still uh, a possible cause that's ongoing. And then finally, um, POTS patients have a lot of comorbidities. And so a lot of patients have chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, many have sleep issues such as insomnia, uh, psychiatric symptoms such as depression, anxiety, and then uh, immune activation, pain, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And all of those things have also been associated with cognitive dysfunction on their own. So it, it kind of gets really unclear as to what's causing what, and maybe some of these comorbidities could be playing a role. And then finally, how do we treat cognitive deficits in POTS? Again, really little data to support any of this, but um, in that Ross study from 2013, patients reported things that helped their brain fog. The things reported were high fluid and salt intake, uh, to raise blood volume, acute water ingestion, physical counter maneuvers, and compression stockings. So these are things that are recommended to all POTS patients to improve their general symptoms, not just brain fog. Uh, there are some anecdotal reports. Um, some patients have tried stimulants, um, things like Adderall, Ritalin, Provigil, or selective, or sorry, sorry serotonin or uptake serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs. Um, some patients report these are effective. Some report that they make things worth, worse. There have been no systematic studies on these medications in POTS. Um, and there is a concern that things like stimulants could worsen the heart rate response. These patients already have an elevated heart rate and that giving them a stimulant or something that increases norepinephrine more could worsen that tachycardia. And then there's been a couple um, registered studies that are looking at things like cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, to see if those can alleviate cognitive deficits and POTS, but those have not been published to date. Um, so now in about 20 minutes, I have told you everything I know about cognitive dysfunction in POTS. Um, so what were the gaps in knowledge that led us to do this pilot study? Um, I mentioned to you that structural brain abnormalities and, and changes in cerebral blood flow have been observed in POTS, suggesting there is a role for the central nervous system in this impaired cognition. Um, but despite this evidence, there's really no data to say if those functional changes or those structural changes are related to changes in function. And there have been no studies examining functional brain activity in vivo in POTS patients. Um, so we proposed in the study that the exaggerated that an exaggerated brain activation during mental tasks um, may be a contributing factor to brain fog and POTS, and that this could be worsened um, by a stimulus such as standing. And we thought about this idea because of previous literature in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, which is a disease I mentioned is commonly present in patients with POTS. And so there have been multiple studies in chronic fatigue syndrome with neuroimaging showing that these patients uh, have additional brain area recruitment when they perform cognitive tasks. So this is just summarizing multiple system systemic reviews in which these patients require larger bold activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, superior frontal gyrus, occipital cortex, and parietal lobe in response to mental tasks. These are all areas involved in cognition. Um, so suggesting that those patients need more mental energy, more brain activation to complete the same task. 
And so in this study, we hypothesized that the brain fog in POTS is related to an increased activation of cognitive brain regions during mental tasks, that they would require more brain activation to complete a task, and that this could be exacerbated by orthostatic stress due to an impaired cerebral autoregulation. Also to test this, we recruited uh, men and women of all races that were diagnosed with POTS based on consensus criteria or were a matched healthy subject to the POTS patient. Uh, these were age 18 to 60 years of age. Um, the POTS patients had to have either mild cognitive impairment or normal cognition, and the healthy subjects had to have normal cognition. Uh, we started out trying to recruit only POTS patients that we could measure cognitive impairment um, with some of those tasks I showed you earlier, but we unfortunately couldn't recruit because many of these patients, as I mentioned earlier, actually score within a normal range on these tests. Uh, they had to be able to tolerate an MRI scanner, so no implanted metal, no claustrophobia, and they had to tolerate our lower body negative pressure tank, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, they had to be right-handed um, to just to have consistency in the areas of the brain activated during the test and fluent in English. And we excluded people taking uh, stimulants or some of those drugs that alter cognition within the last three months. Uh, other potential causes for tachycardia in POTS. If they required glasses for vision correction, they could not complete the study because the head scanner um, was too tight to allow the glasses to be in place. And pregnant or breastfeeding women were excluded. Uh, so they first participated in a screening visit. And for this screening visit, we withheld any medications that affected blood pressure, heart rate, or cognition for at least 24 hours. The participants then underwent a medical history and physical examination with pregnancy test if relevant. Uh, they then underwent cognitive testing. So for this, we used a paper version of that Stroop word color test that I showed you earlier, where they see a word that's written, uh, but the color may be different than what the word says. And they completed that test while they were lying down and while they were standing. That order of when they completed it was randomized and counterbalanced to control for any learning effects. If they screened in based on their um, Stroop word color test, so if they had a, either normal or mild cognition, we then proceeded to measure their orthostatic vital signs. So we measured their blood pressure and heart rate while they were supine, and then while they were standing for up to 10 minutes. And we took blood samples while they were lying down and while they were standing to measure um, catecholamines and other hormone systems. We then tested their ability to tolerate our lower body negative pressure device. And if they passed all of that, they were sent home with questionnaires to complete in REDCap to answer questions about their demographics um, and patient history. So if they screened into the study, they were asked to complete two study visits that were separated by at least one week within the Penn State's uh, NMR Center for Research. This was a randomized crossover study in which they were subjected to a sham pressure or a lower body negative pressure. And the lower body negative pressure was increased stepwise and held at minus 40 for 30 minutes. So this is a picture of the setup in the fMRI scanner. Um, so they were instrumented to go into the scanner for brain imaging. Uh, this on their legs is the lower body negative pressure tank or the LBNP tank. Uh, this is an fMRI compatible tank, which is extremely rare. Um, typically these tanks have a lot of metal on them. Um, but Mick Herr, clinical engineer in the HVI, designed this tank um, to be compatible with the fMRI. And essentially, you put it around the lower body, and when you turn it on, it, it exerts a vacuum-like effect, and it, it basically pulls the blood into the lower extremities, which is what would happen when you stand. So this kind of tank is typically used either to mimic a standing position or, um, in some cases, people use it to mimic a hemorrhage-like effect at higher pressures. And so we can either turn on a sham pressure, we turn the vacuum on, but it's not sucking, just the noise, or they feel the pressure um, to kind of mimic standing while they're in the tank. I know it looks strange, but it's actually super cool. We are one of maybe two or three groups worldwide that have the capability to do this. So we can study how the brain's affected in disorders of, of standing. Okay. Uh, this was the overall protocol for the study design. So once the patients were situated in that tank and put into the imaging system, uh, we took an anatomy brain scan. 
We then did ASL imaging arterial spin labeling. This is to measure the perfusion in the brain, the blood perfusion. Uh, so these are baseline measurements. We then turned on either the sham or the lower body negative pressure. Again, we started at low pressures and kind of escalated it upward so they could get used to the pressure uh, over time. We then held the pressure stable at minus 40 or they had the sham pressure. We repeated the uh, brain perfusion imaging to see how the pressure changed the perfusion in the brain. We then started the blood oxygen level dependent fMRI imaging which I'll talk about in a second. And then we continued with that while we gave them a computerized version of that Stroop task. And then we performed the brain perfusion imaging again at the end of the study. Uh, so for the fMRI methods, we use the 3T scanner over in the N NMR core. We perform blood oxygen level dependent or bold T2 imaging um, to look at neural activity. We performed arterial spin labeling to look at blood perfusion. Differences between POTS and controls was calculated at P less than 0 0.001, and we used an extent threshold of six voxels. I will say this is certainly not my area of expertise. This protocol was designed um, with the help of Dr. Jean Li Wang and Jeff Fessick over in the NMR center. Uh, we then used a computerized Stroop interference task. Uh, so the task consisted of four runs. A run was four blocks, a block was 12 trials, and a trial was either a congruent, an incongruent, or a neutral word. So example of a congruent word would be the word says red, and it's written in red. So the word matches the color. That would be congruent. An incongruent trial is where the word and the color don't match, and they have to tell you the color and not the word. And then a neutral stimulus would be a word that isn't associated with a color, and they have to tell you the color of the ink. So for example, hat written in green. And the participants had a five finger uh, paddle with them in the MRI machine, and each finger corresponded to a different color. So as they saw the stimulus, they would use the finger um, to, to click on what color the ink was written in. And you can see the colors here, the thumb was red, the pointer was blue, the middle finger was green, and the ring finger was yellow. And so the Stroop effect was looking at the neural activation in response to congruent versus incongruent word blocks. Uh, this protocol was actually designed by another group and we, we replicated it. And the reference is down at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so we were able to enroll in this pilot study five POTS patients and five matched healthy controls. So they were similar in age, on average about 25 years of age, ranging from 22 to 50-ish 50, years. All were female. Um, on average, their education level was 16 years. So they had a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, BMI, they were in kind of a normal to slightly overweight range. And for the POTS patients, the age of onset was approximately 23 years of age, ranging from 13 to 35 years. So fairly well matched in terms of sex, education, and age. Uh, we performed orthostatic stress testing. And what we saw was that blood pressure remained fairly um, stable in POTS patients and controls when they went from supine to standing position. The heart rate in POTS patients went from 72 to 99 beats per minute. In healthy controls, it went from 63 to 81 beats per minute. Um, their norepinephrine level in POTS was higher when standing compared to controls. We also gave them an orthostatic symptom score while they were lying down and standing. Um, the healthy controls reported no symptoms in either position. The POTS patients had mild symptoms lying down and their symptom burden about doubled when they were standing. And then these are their Stroop word color scores on screening. Um, and as you can see, the POTS patients were kind of in this normal range between 40 to 50, um, but it was lower than the healthy controls, which were between 50 to 60. So again, they were a little bit worse than the controls, but they were still within a normal range in general in terms of cognitive function. Do you see? Okay. Sorry, I saw the chat. I was making sure I wasn't missing anything. Um, and so what we found was that POTS patients do have an increased neural activation during the Stroop testing, even in the sham condition. So when we turn on the sham pressure in the vacuum, so there's no real stimulus, 
we still saw a stronger activation in the POTS patients in the, latter, the left anterior cingulate cortex, the bilateral prefrontal cortex, the right temporal lobe, and the right cerebellum um, in response compared to the controls in response to that incongruent versus congruent condition. So this matched our hypothesis that they would have more brain activation even under resting conditions. We then wanted to look at how they did when the tank was turned on and that lower body negative pressure was applied. And this exacerbated things even further. So when the lower body negative pressure tank was turned on, we saw greater activation of these executive function regions, including the anterior cingulate and the bilateral prefrontal cortices. We also saw an increased motor activation in the POTS patients. So in the left motor cortex and left premotor cortex, we're not sure why. We don't know if this is kind of in response to the button pushing or, or something else, but that's still under investigation. We then looked at those measures of brain perfusion uh, in the POTS patients. So these are this ASL imaging that was taken at baseline uh, after the pressure and at the end. And we saw no differences in POTS versus controls at baseline. So at this time point, or in either group following the sham pressure. So when nothing was turned on, the brain perfusion seemed fine. But under that lower body negative pressure, the POTS patients had decreased perfusion compared to controls, but again, in this left motor cortex. So in these motor regions and not in these cognitive regions. And we're still trying to understand that effect. Uh, so to conclude, the POTS participants did have an increased activation to a mental task in neural areas involved in executive function. Um, during sham conditions, but particularly during that lower body negative pressure, there was increased motor and premotor cortex activation in POTS during LBMP conditions and decreased blood perfusion in the motor cortex. We're still trying to understand what that, what that reflects in these patients. And these data do suggest that POTS patients may require more diffuse brain activation and increased neural energy to complete the same cognitive task. So they're performing at a similar level, maybe a little less than controls, but they're requiring much more brain activity to be able to do that. Um, so the goal of this study, it was a pilot study, and we wanted to see if there were potential cognitive brain regions that could be involved in this cognitive dysfunction. I think we did that. Um, and we've at least collected some preliminary data that we plan to apply for a larger R01 grant to, to validate this and expand it to a larger cohort of patients. Um, and we hope that this can maybe provide some insight eventually into how we treat this condition. Um, one really cool thing would be to see how stimulants may affect this pattern of brain activation and if it, they improve cognition, um, we might be able to think about what neurotransmitter pathways could be involved based on some of these results and try to target therapies to that, as well as see how motor training, physical therapy, occupational therapy may change this brain region activation in response to POTS. So it's a start <laughs> that will hopefully go further. Uh, and that's really all I had for today. So I'm happy to have discussion or questions if you would like. If you have questions for Dr. Arnold, please feel free to unmute. You guys are being too easy on me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, if nobody has any questions at this time, you can always reach out to us. And if you think of something after the presentation or in a couple days, please reach out. We can always answer those questions. I also want to invite you to visit our website. I just put it into the chat. The website for the CTSI has a ton of information. Um, not only about upcoming events, but also uh, many different things, many different programs. So please check out our website. And I want to thank you for attending and keep an eye out for next month's TSS seminar. Thanks, everyone.